Hi, Tim Two Wheels here, and on this how-to video, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're actually going to fabricate our own custom rear rack for a KLR 650. So stick around, we'll get started right after this. So in this step, we are uh, countersinking our holes to mount to the frame. Uh, when it's done, it will look like that. Um, still have to drill my hole here. So on this end of the bar, which is the end uh, that will be closest to the bike, you can see I have my uh, quarter inch hole drilled, but I haven't uh, chamfered it yet or countersunk it so that the screw would sit in. So let's go ahead and, and drill this and let you see what that looks like. So the key is to just take your time. Anytime you're drilling or cutting steel, you can't be in a hurry. I've got my drill press set to uh, 250 RPMs, the slowest speed that it'll go, and that way my bits and the material doesn't heat up. So you drill for a while, then let off, see how you're doing. And it's starting to take shape, but we need to be a little deeper than that. getting close now it's about to the edge of the bevel so what I will do now is test fit uh, each hole as I'm drilling it with the head of the screw so I have my screw and you'll see it's setting just a tad high uh, so I want it to set flush so I'm going to take out just a little bit more material And that should do it right there. So let's bring this out, just for a bolt. And there, that's, that's nice. It's, it feels perfectly uh, flush to the uh, top of the material there. And you can kind of see that. That's all there is to it. All right, so I wanted to show you a little bit about uh, using a tap and die. If you, if you guys have not, uh, any of you have not used a tap before, a tap uh, will cut the threads into the hole that you've drilled. I'm using, uh, these uh, Irwin Hansen uh, tap set. I uh, picked this up for about six or eight dollars at, at my local Lowe's hardware. Um, I also have used DeWalt, which you can get at Home Depot, um, or you know, check your other local hardware. As you can see, it's six millimeter by 1.0 millimeter thread pitch. And uh, I like these Irwins because they are, uh, you can see, they have a uh, kind of a flute start that'll self-start and self-align as they start, so it gives you a good straight fit. So again, it comes with the number nine drill bit. You drill your holes and then you start it and then start cutting. So um, what I really wanted to show you was that with a, um, a, a, a tap this small, six millimeters is fairly small, and you can see in comparison to my hand here, um, and, and you can twist them off. In fact, I have, uh, I've already broken one of these and it's very frustrating because you, it's, they're, they're nearly impossible to get out of a steel hole that you're tapping. I want to show you my technique that it has worked well for delicate, smaller taps. Let me get ahead and get down to the bottom of where I'm at here, right here. You can see it's, it's hitting. It's starting to cut at that point. So my technique has been to, um, just turn it a quarter of a turn, um, you know, with your, uh, to just turn it a cut, a quarter, a turn at a time. No more than that, or your material will start to bind up in the flutes. And, um, and then uh, it will, uh, you can bind and possibly break your tap. So if you turn it only a quarter of a turn from here, and I'm cutting right now, and I'll stop there, and then I'll back it off and keep twisting around until I've cleared out the channel or those threads until it's nice and smooth. And then from there, I'll do it another quarter of a turn. Now, you may think this is going to take a long time doing it that way, but once you get in a groove like this, get a pattern going, it, it really doesn't take that long. It, it takes me just a few minutes to cut the threads all the way down to the bottom. So only a quarter of a turn. 
Um, now bigger tap sets, when you get up like around half inch or even bigger, uh, or eight millimeter and bigger, uh, you know, you can, you can cut more and put more pressure on it. But, um, you know, any of you guys, if you've ever broken a tap off, uh, in steel especially, you know what a pain in the butt it is to get out. Uh, in aluminum, there's a way to chemically dissolve it. Um, but since I'm cutting into steel, that's not really an option as far as I know. So anyway, as you can see, I'm just going to keep doing this. Only cutting a quarter of a turn, back it off, work it till it's nice and smooth and free and not binding. And then I'll do another quarter of a turn. Work it till it's smooth and then cut another quarter. Now using this technique, I've cut six holes so far and haven't broken uh, a tap. And, um, and so that's, that's what you wanna do. Uh, take your time because I tell you, if you do break tap off, then you're looking at major problems of rebuilding everything that you've done up to that point on that particular piece. So better safe than sorry in my, in my book. All right, now we're getting down here to the bottom of the tap, and this is pretty close. Let me take out the vise here and show you. Uh, you can see my tap is starting to cut through the bottom here, and uh, threads are not clean all the way through, but it's far enough because my screw is only going to go about, uh, probably about two-thirds of the way into this material. So I'm just about done with it. You know, now this is not really a lesson on how to use it, but I just thought I would throw this in um, just in case anyone has not, is not familiar with using a tap. And um, you just want to see how to do it uh, without causing yourself a lot of headaches and frustration. All right, so I'm down as far as I can go. I've tapped out on the shoulder of the, of the tap. So now I'm just working this. And we'll go ahead and work it out. Uh, something else, you can back it out and use uh, some cutting oil. This happens to be some honing oil that I used. I just put a few drops in there and uh, it helped to lubricate the process. So let me go ahead and back this tap all the way out because my threads are in there. And you'll see when you get toward the top, you want to hold it straight so it doesn't mess up your threads. But you can see, hopefully, how how that looks. Um, and you see these flutes that are in the, uh, the tap and, and how it gets that material on there, the, the, the dust. So uh, you may want to back it out occasionally. So now what I'm going to do is, is kind of flush the hole out. I'm just using actually uh, rim oil for my guns. <laughs> it's uh, pretty good. And wiping the uh, tap off to get any residue off of there. I'm going to run it back through again just to get any uh, particles that are in the hole um, out. So we're just going to run the tap all the way back down. To the bottom. Not really cutting this time. We're just cleaning out the threads. And then we back it all the way out. And with the oil uh, and the clean tap, we will have cleared out the threads, any, any additional residue that was down there. And by residue, I'm meaning particles of metal, shavings from, from when you, uh, we just cut the threads. All right, so now, using one of the screws that I'm going to be using, I like to just kind of run it in, wipe everything off here, just run it down by hand and make sure there's no binding or resistance. And I'm able to, to screw this in by hand, and it's working well. So, and see, it's, it's pulling out some. So we can spray it again just to help flush out those threads. And wipe down our piece. And you can see there's the bottom of it. Now this hole has been countersunk, uh, bored out, because the, um, the bolt or screw is going to set flush. Uh, because the screw is going to set flush there, and that's what's going to mount down to the frame. And then these secondary holes, these smaller holes that are tapped, will be what holds the, um, 
uh, top plate on of our rack with our spacers and everything. So it'll sit there with the spacers and then our metal plate will sit uh, above the frame. Okay, so now uh, we've got all of our parts cut and uh, the pieces that need it have the uh, steel inserts inside and they're welded into place as well as they've all been drilled, countersunk, and uh, uh, tapped the holes that need to be tapped, which are this one, this one, here, here, and then these two uh, on the end of it. Uh, so my next step is going to be to um, uh, start to tack this together and get it in place, get everything in line, make sure everything's nice and square. Then I'll go ahead and weld all of my joints. Um, everything is, is drilled, even my cross piece here that's going to mount uh, to the subframe uh, through the rear fender. And I have some marks. Uh, they may not show up on camera, but I have some faint marks showing where everything is going to go. Uh, and that's how it's going to look. I'll record a little bit of the welding just so you can see how it's done, but I'm not going to record welding all these joints. That would just be monotonous and too much, take up too much time. So what I'm going to do is I'll, uh, I'm going to weld up basically one side. I'll start tacking and getting to here lined up. And then uh, what I'll do is make sure that's all square and in good shape. And then I'll put it together, make sure everything lines up on the bike, mount this to the bike, mount this side to the bike, and then just to make sure I've double checked my alignment, then I will take it off the bike. I'm not gonna weld it on the motorcycle uh, for electrical issues. Uh, and then uh, bring it back over here and then tack and make sure that I get it all welded up nice and square. And then I'll show you how uh, I'm welding with flux core wire on a MIG welder, but it's, um, it's gonna be ugly uh, initially because I'm not a professional welder. But I'll show you that even a, a weld, I just wanna make sure they're strong, not necessarily pretty. And then I'll show you how I grind it down and get it prepped for, um, uh, for a painting. I'm gonna prime it and then I'll, I'll paint it. So I'm gonna start on this joint uh, right over here. Uh, have it clamped. I have it, uh, this piece clamped to my table and I've got one of my magnets uh, holding this one in place. And I'm just gonna start tacking on the corners here. Now I probably won't be able to talk or you might not be able to hear me. So I'll just do it and then talk about it afterwards. There, just tack the uh, corners uh, to hold it. Now I'm going to tack it down on the sides a bit uh, so that it doesn't draw while I'm welding it. Okay, so now I've got the joints just tacked. Uh, some of these are just tacked on the top, so when I flip this, I'm gonna be very, very careful with it and tack the bottom before I start uh, welding along here. As we've talked about before, I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, I don't wanna just run a bead all the way here. Uh, running a full bead gets too hot. Uh, this is fairly thin material. This is only 14 gauge. Uh, even though I have my welder set to the appropriate setting, actually I have it set just a little bit low. Um, you can melt through or blow through uh, this light of material. So what I'm gonna do is essentially do a series of spot welds in order to complete the weld and make it a full. So let's go ahead and flip this over. Again, I'm not gonna weld this final piece in place because I wanna make sure my bolt alignment is right on the bike. So again, just being careful because just these little spot welds are not real strong at this point. So I'm going to 
to lay this over. Then I will do my tack welds uh, double checking uh, squareness. So I've got the whole frame welded up, or not the whole frame, but this half uh, welded up. Uh, the only thing that's really missing is the other sidebar, and I'm going to wait till I get that bolted up to make sure everything's in alignment and see how much gap I'll have, if any. Uh, so now what I want to show you is how to, some of these welds, you can see, uh, they're just a series of spot welds, um, and uh, they are not the prettiest, but uh, you know it, they're they're strong. Uh, they seem to be good welds. Uh, it's not a, a beautiful bead, but what I'm going to show you is how I can grind that. I'm just using my angle grinder here, uh, and I have a flap disc on, um, and I'm going to rub that lightly. Uh, this thing uh, can eat away the metal pretty quickly, so you, you want to be careful. So let's take a look at how we can polish up uh, the metal, or uh, make it look a little bit better. So I'm going to get my clamp just to hold everything in place so it doesn't move around and let's So at this point I was able to see a few spots I'd like to touch up, uh, make sure there's no holes in it, and then we'll, um, so we'll keep working it. Alright, so I wanted to show you a close up now. I have my rack uh, painted uh, and uh, and mounted to the bike now, so it is it is attached to the frame or to the uh, mounting points here. Uh, I, I use the Rust-Oleum uh, hammered finished paint. Uh, it's not exactly black black. It is I got a bit of a grayish, or perhaps it might be called a gunmetal finish. Uh, but uh, it turned out really well. Uh, one, it gave it a nice uh, texture finish uh, on here. Uh, this hammer tone enamel is pretty durable. I've used it on trailers and, and some of the other uh, stuff around here. Now, a little forward here, I'll show you. Uh, you can see how the, the screws that I used, and we've talked about those in detail, how they're nice and flush mounted uh, for, to the frame, so it's smooth surface. Uh, also, I use uh, some of the original uh, cap head uh, bolts or screws that came out of the mounting plate, the factory mounting plate. They were just the right length. I do have a couple of the same <clears throat> same 15 millimeter spacers uh, between uh, the, uh, the fender and uh, this uh, piece of angle iron here. It's the same 15 millimeter spacers that I'm going to use here uh, to lift the uh, uh, the decks or the platforms uh, right off of the uh, off of the frame. So that <laughs> that was fortunate. It worked out uh, well, uh, some of you may have noticed that uh, my factory tool case uh, has been removed here. Uh, and, and I have a, a pigtail coming up here. And in case you've been wondering what this is for, I do have a GV top case. Uh, my street uh, deck that I'm going to put on here, or road deck, that is going to have the mount, uh, the monolock mount for the uh, GV top case. <clears throat> I have the rear brake light, LED brake light, in the GV case. And uh, this, I, I created this little pigtail so that I can just plug it in and it tucks down in this little compartment. Uh, the deck will cover this solid. I'm not going to have a cutout here for the tool case because I don't use the factory toolbox. But yet, uh, I left everything to where it could easily be reassembled and the uh, original factory uh, top case or 
deck plate back here could be put back on. So uh, with just a few screws, I can have everything back to the way it was uh, originally. So I'm very happy with that. Uh, additionally, let me show you something here. Um, you'll notice I, I, I welded a couple of little tabs, uh, just uh, thin metal tabs that stick out here that I use to mount my light. Uh, this is the uh, add more lighting uh, tail light that I've added. Uh, since this deck extended out uh, over the factory tail light, which is back here, the factory tail light is still visible from the rear uh, if a vehicle was behind me. But for uh, taller vehicles such as uh, uh, semis or uh, you know uh, high vehicles, even large four-wheel drive trucks, um, with my deck extended out even beyond here, uh, I was concerned about uh, blocking my tail light. Uh, so what I did is I, I bolted on one of the add more. This is the small light bar that they have and and mounted it back here on the rear. And this is just to enhance my factory tail light and provide me even more visibility. I'll show you a demo next of the uh, uh, the functions of this tail light and how it looks in conjunction with the with the tail light. Right now I have. Uh, well, first of all, you can tell I'm in a bright sunlight on a, on a nice, clear, sunny day. Uh, I've got the camera setting about 10 yards uh, behind the bike and uh, the height is set roughly at what a car, a driver uh, eye level would be. So I'll pull the bike up in a straight position and let's turn it on so you can see the tail light. Uh, so that's what you would see from a tail light perspective. Uh, so the uh, visibility is, is improved even in, in the bright sunlight. So let's uh, hit the brakes, and here we go. And so you see the modulation of the add more tail light along with the modulator. Now in my, in my stock tail light, it has been replaced with the LED modulating LED upgrade, um, but it's not as bright as I would like it to be. So I think the add more adds to it. Now what I'd like to point out on the add more light, if you reapply the brakes within 10 to 15 seconds, it just goes solid. It does not modulate. Uh, and that is by design, according to the add more folks, um, is so that it does not irritate the drivers behind you. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that, to be honest with you. I, I want to irritate them. I want them to notice me, <laughs> especially if I'm stopping so that they don't run over me. But at any rate, that's why it doesn't do that. So now if you go beyond the 10 to 15 second mark, which maybe we are now, if you reapply, you get the modulation again. But again, if I let off and hit it again, it just goes solid. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at the turn signal. So the Edmore module or Edmore light bar has uh, turn signals built into it. So let's apply the left turn signal and you see the, I like the swiping uh, yellow LED motion there and it helps to complement and accent the uh, turn signal on the bike. And let's apply the right. So there's the right turn signal. And when we shut them off, here is the turn signal with brake. So you can see it still stands out. Anyway, uh, so there, I wanted to show you how that works. And uh, you can see that even in a bright sunny day, it, um, it has good, uh, good visibility. All right, so what I'm going to show you here is uh, how I'm laying out for the larger uh, off-road or camping slash pickup truck uh, uh, top plate. Uh, for comparison's sake, uh, here is my uh, street plate, my normal plate. Uh, I just have it primed right now, but it's already finished. All the holes are drilled and it's been primed and, and I'll be painting that uh, soon here. Uh, but that's to give you an idea of where the frame is underneath the bike. Uh, underneath this top plate and how how big it is. So this is a uh, 24 by 24 sheet of aluminum uh, that I have here and that I'm laying out. Now originally I was going to keep it 24 by 24 and just shape you know uh, round off the corners and whatnot and just give me one big platform. Uh, but however after getting it on the bike and getting it set where I want it and having it all centered I think it's just too big uh, for what I want. Uh, now, some of you guys may want uh, a platform this big for hauling 
whatever. Uh, but at any rate, uh, what I've decided to do is to trim it in just a bit. And one of the reasons is that it sticks over uh, quite a bit. Uh, two inches in is where the edge of the turn signals are underneath here. So um, I wanted to keep it as wide as I could in the back, uh, but I wanted to narrow it just a tad in the front. And the reason for that is uh, I'm going to be mounting panniers uh, on the, the bike here soon. I'll be putting racks on and I want to have both hard and soft panniers. But I'm likely going to be starting off with the hard panniers uh, and uh, I wanted to be able to get to the lids for one thing and be able to get them on and off the bike without them being up under here too far. And having them under there is not that big of a problem, but I also want to be able to stack gear on top of my panniers, uh, like um, dry bags or uh, sleeping bags or whatever, rolled gear that I can strap to the top of the panniers. So I didn't want having the wider rack here uh, negate the usefulness of the top of the panniers. So what I've decided to do is to uh, lay it out. You see, the, you see the layout lines here. Let me go ahead and, and take this one off um, and set it aside. So uh, first of all, I marked out my, uh, this is 24 by 24, so I put a line dead center and also center way. So the, these two cross lines just represent the center of the plate. And I already have it positioned on my rack to where I want it to be and I've marked where the holes are. And I'll show you a nifty little trick for doing that here in just a minute. So uh, to start with, instead of the full 24 inch width, I decided to bring it in two inches on either side. And so by bringing it in two inches, that gives me a width of 20 inches from here to here. So at the widest point in the rear is gonna be 20 inches. Uh, I've also decided to take two inches off the front because it's right now it's hanging over my seat. Now I could cantilever it off the back of the bike, but I don't really want it hanging over too far on the back to obscure the new tail light that I put on. Uh, so I have it centered where I want it to be. And then I also brought it in an additional two inches in the front to give me room to come up from my panniers with gear and to make my, the inside of my panniers more easily accessible. So basically, coming in two inches here, I'll cut across the top. I'll cut down here off two inches. And then I'm also gonna come in two more inches in the front, a total of four. So that'll give me a total width across the front here of uh, 16 inches on the front part of the rack. Uh, it'll be 20 inches across the rear. And it's gonna have a total length of 22 inches uh, on, the, on the plate. And I, I personally think that's gonna give me uh, enough surface area for what I wanted to do. So before we get started cutting this plate out, uh, I want to lift this off and show you how I, how I marked the bottom. What I, I did was I made these little um, uh, bolt studs, if you will, points for marking. So I thought about it, I have a template and I didn't want to risk getting, when you're, when you're trying to align six holes, uh, it's best to mark them. So what I did was basically, let me pull one of these out. I went to the hardware store and just got some uh, cheapo six millimeter uh, bolts and I cut the head off of them. They were just Phillips head uh, six millimeter screws. I cut the head off of them and then I put them on my little grinder and just ground them to a, uh, ground them to a point. Uh, and I'll show you a picture up close here. Then I took some uh, nylon locking washer or nuts and just screwed up on there so that I could adjust them and then even lock them down in place, give me more surface area. So basically I screwed uh, one in each of my points here. I positioned my aluminum plate very carefully exactly where I want it. Uh, I measured off the sides, made sure everything was center line, straight and correct. And then I took uh, a hammer or I actually have a dead blow mallet that I use and I struck the top of the aluminum plate uh, over, each, uh, over each of these little uh, punches. Um, and so what it did was it gave me a nice uh, punch here, a hole location under the bottom. Uh, I, I then flipped this over, laid it on my workbench and took a center punch and hit them again to make them even more pronounced. So what that's done is it's given me precisely 
where my bolt locations uh, are going to be so that when I drill them, I don't have to worry about uh, being off and have to wallow one of them out. So I did the exact same thing on this plate. Uh, here, I just want to show you a close-up of, uh, this is going to be my, my road plate and uh, with the holes that I drilled out. And then, of course, I, after I drilled them, I did the countersinking, and uh, this is where my, my bolts will be uh, for the, my road plate. Now this plate, I'm going to, these holes are for mounting my uh, GV monolock. Now I have the auxiliary uh, brake light in my monolock case, or my GV top case. So that's what this wire and this connection is for here, these contacts. So when you snap the case on, it makes contact and you have a, I have a brake light in my uh, tail, in a tail light in my uh, uh, top case. So as I mentioned before, the goal is to have this for my kind of everyday plate, uh, normal road riding plate, if I'm just tootling around for the weekend, and then I can easily take those six screws out, pull this off, put this monster on, and then I have my uh, traveling uh, high capacity plate uh, to load all my camping gear on and, and whatnot. So that's it. The next step is uh, I'm going to be uh, going ahead and cutting this guy out and getting it ready to, to mount. All right, so before I uh, actually uh, assemble this and get it on the bike, I just wanted to, to give you a look at the uh, top plate uh, with the color code on it. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out, the texture, the finish overall. Now I did uh, prime this. Uh, as you saw earlier, it was primed white. I just used some of the Rust-Oleum uh, aluminum primer on it. Uh, it puts a, a white coat, a flat white coat on there. And then uh, I hit it with uh, the Rust-Oleum hammered uh, finish. Uh, just this is the same paint that I used on the rack, uh, the base rack itself. 
Uh, now it's not a it's not an expert finish because it was pretty windy the day that I, I painted this but this is dry and you can see uh, I'm, I'm happy with the color it's not quite as nice as like an anodized finished but uh, anodized finish but overall I'm pretty happy with it so I'm getting ready to mount this plate on the bike and I wanted to assemble with my GB um, mount and you can see here it's not the prettiest in the world but I took my Dremel and routed out uh, the edge of the uh, base and what that does is it gives me a angle let's see if I can angle this up here so you can see it a little bit better but what this does is it allows me to have access to the two screw mounts right here uh, easily because once this top plate or this base is mounted to the plate uh, it's going to stay there uh, and this is really going to be my plate that I use to put my GV top case on the bike and ride around town and for, for most of my normal daily riding. Um, and then, uh, next, you saw me cut this out on the bandsaw, but this will be my big uh, camping, off-road, touring, uh, when I want to strap a lot of gear to the back of the bike. And I've got the uh, six holes already drilled in here. So uh, once I get the street plate mounted, I'm going to start working on this top plate and getting all these edges sanded over, smooth the corners out with my belt sander, uh, and then also counter uh, or uh, countersink these these holes for the uh, for the screws, and uh, and then the next step would be to start cutting uh, slots in. Okay, so just wanted to show you what it looks like with my uh, monolock uh, base uh, from GV mounted onto the case here, or onto the plate. Uh, so that is all mounted. I used the original uh, GV bolts and nuts that came with it. I bought some uh, stainless steel washers. Uh, these are quarter inch by one uh, washers at my local hardware store and just put on here. So these are stainless, just from these are going to be exposed to the weather and I didn't want them to, to rust. Um, the aluminum is painted and primed, so I'm not worried about any sort of galvanic uh, corrosion against that. And then, of course, the nuts and bolts are steel, so that's not going to be a problem. I, I did not cut these shorter. I just left them at their standard length uh, to go through the case and stick out. Uh, because my plate is elevated and it's not going to hit anything, plus my bars go across in between. So I ran my wire through this hole and ran it up and I just used cable ties to tie it to the longer bolts to keep it in place. And uh, next thing I'm going to just uh, mount it to the bike, show you what that looks like. Okay, so now what I want to do is, is assemble, we're actually going to mount this to our frame. Uh, so I just flip it over here and earlier I showed you that I had this little pigtail set up. And this is just to provide the uh, brake light uh, function to the um, brake light on my GV top case. So right here, uh, I just flip this over, plug this in, and the wire sets down in the, what used to be the tool compartment. It's weather sealed. And then the plate will sit on the frame just like that. So next I'm going to put my spacers and my screws in and uh, get this installed. And then we'll put the top case on and show you what that looks like. So for mounting, I'm going to be using my six millimeter or M6 by 35 millimeter long screws to go down through the mounting holes along with my 15 millimeter spacers. Everything is uh, snugged up. So now I'm just going to go in and tighten them down. I don't like the way I, I probably should have waited to let my paint cure a little bit more because it's knocking some of the paint off. So I may have to touch that back up here in a little bit. But now my plate is securely mounted to the frame. It's nice and sturdy. And as you can see, I have a, a gap between it because of those 15 millimeter spacers. And the top case is, it goes here. So here's my GV top case. I just line up the front and snap it in place, and there we go.
So these configuration changes, just wanted to show you some of the versatility and the different ways that you can load your gear uh, on this uh, back rack. Uh, I'm very happy with the way everything turned out. I'm actually gonna leave this uh, off-road plate in just uh, bare aluminum because it's gonna take a lot of abuse and beating and I don't wanna be scratching up paint. So here's a couple of examples of pictures uh, from different angles. I know this was a very long video. I hope it helps you uh, see what you can do if you wanna take these plans and use them as is or modify them for your needs. As always, thanks for watching. This is Tim Two Wheels. That's how I did it.